So uh, I welcome you all to this IFSA uh, ICWA lecture series. And today we are very fortunate to have Mr. Sanjeev Mehta uh, from Unilever to speak with us. Uh, and as India moves towards an Atma Nirbhar Bharat, interaction with the corporate world would add to our understanding of the India that we represent, Indian interests, including business interests around the world. So I would like to really thank you, Mr. Mehta, for taking your time off and joining us. And without uh, saying more, taking more time, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Anupam Ray, who will be moderating this session today. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Gloria. Welcome, Sanjeev. Delighted. Good, morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, colleagues across the world. I can see that uh, from amongst the people I know extremely well, my batchmate in uh, Peru and my close friend Shambhu Kumaran in Manila. So that gives you a geographic spread. And I can see Sanjeev Singla in the middle of the world in, 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 uh, in Israel. So that gives uh, you an idea of the geographic uh, spread of the uh, officers who are involved and the kind of interest that uh, you have evoked uh, uh, in this uh, group. This is a series that we try to, we have uh, launched recently, uh, in which we try to uh, expose our officers to uh, different kinds of things. You know, bureaucrats are supposed to be knowledge proof. We are trying to uh, break that uh, uh, mold. And uh, it's, it's, we are really honored that you were the first uh, private sector uh, speaker that we have. In fact, in, in, in my memory, which goes back 26 years in the Foreign Service, I do not recall a, a, for, a, a Foreign Service Association meeting ever being addressed by a private sector figure. So we, uh, we can think really of no one better than you to begin this, uh, uh, to begin this involvement. To, many, to my colleagues, uh, Unilever uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a worldwide brand and a worldwide uh, entity. Uh, I think its turnover is uh, globally is in the region of, uh, of about 60 billion euros. Unilever India, from what I could gather from the internet, has a turnover of about 40,000 crores, which to put things in perspective is about three times the size of our ministry in terms of uh, the numbers involved. It has about 21,000 employees, which again, to put things in perspective, is about three times the size of our uh, ministry. Uh, you know, before I come to Sanjeev, there are a couple of things that uh, uh, I would like to say about Unilever, just a couple of points. I think it's always been seen as a thought leader. And these are the reasons why we thought of uh, inviting the Unilever CEO and not just Sanjeev uh, to, to, uh, to this meeting. I've personally uh, been very impressed by its uh, narrative management. You know, I can't think of any other company which has consistently had good press and, and a good reputation throughout its off. It's very hard earned, I understand that. And we need to learn from you how uh, you do that. It's also a model in terms of how you manage personnel. Uh, Sanjeev, for instance, if I'm not mistaken, has been a CEO from the time he was 40. So, and has been running businesses for the last uh, 20 years. So it's like, uh, I mean, the equivalent would roughly be somebody being foreign secretary at the age of 40 and then holding the job for the next 20 years. So that uh, gives a, that's a very different perspective from uh, what uh, uh, we have. Uh, you know, this is also a time, it's a very fast changing world. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me when I was thinking yesterday is uh, in our prime minister's narrative of Swachh Bharat and all that, you cannot take a bath with Google. You know, it is, uh, there are some products which are going to survive you, you, you know, when you need to wash your hair or you need to brush your teeth, you cannot do it digitally. You, it has to be a, a brick and mortar product in a, uh, in a, in a real product which you hold in your, uh, in your hands. And to that extent, I mean, I was, uh, uh, it is always interesting to see Unilever landing at the, in front of the pack, even at that point of uh, uh, time. I've known Sanjeev for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm not going to uh, inflict the details or, or I'm not going to talk about his uh, CV to you. All of you have seen it. He's a man of very remarkable achievements. I'll just say one or two things. One is that he's one of the most humble men I've known. 
uh, you know, for a man at, uh, of that stature to have the kind of humility that he has shows a very evolved person. He has a razor sharp uh, intellect. Uh, I've, uh, I don't think I've met too many people at that uh, uh, level of, uh, of uh, cognitive and intellectual uh, ability. It's uh, just uh, remarkable. He's a people's man. He cares. Uh, I've, uh, the, he reaches out when it hits his people. He reaches out for uh, all of them. I mean, he's obviously a man who leads from both his head and his, uh, and his, uh, and his heart. Uh, Sanjeev, one of the first books I read when I joined the service was Prakash Tandon's uh, memoirs, you know, Punjab Saga. We hope that you two will uh, write uh, uh, something like that uh, uh, when you uh, finish uh, your tenure at, uh, uh, on, uh, in, in, in Unilever. I'd like to end with that. The floor is yours, uh, Sanjeev. The rules that we follow are that you, you, know, you please speak for as long as you uh, want. Uh, at the end of your, uh, whenever you finish, we will open the floor for questions. I'm sure there'll uh, be a lot. The, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the technical house rules, uh, everybody please uh, stay muted. If you want to, uh, say, if you want to ask questions, you can either uh, send it to me on the chat option, or you can WhatsApp it to me directly, or uh, you can ask for the floor, and I'll uh, and uh, unmute yourself, and and you can ask the question. Sanjeev, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anupam, for a very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Absolutely delighted and honored to share my thoughts with all of you. I have worked outside India for 21 years, and in every country that I went to, I interacted and befriended many IFS officers, and uh, many of them have become our lifelong friends. Even when I was abroad, I kept very close touch with what was happening back home. About seven years back, I returned home to lead Hindustan Unilever, and I've had a ringside view of things happening and events unfolding. Today, I plan to share my thoughts from my lens on a variety of subjects, micro and macro, short term and long term, as well as some philosophical issues. And after that, I would be very happy to take any questions that you may have, and I'll do my best to answer. Now, Unilever has operations on the ground in over 150 countries, and every day, over 2 billion people somewhere in the world use one or more of our brands. As a large global business, we do a very systematic assessment of risk, stemming from business and competitors, regulatory, geopolitical, climate and environment, and several other dimensions. A pandemic did feature in our discussions on several occasions, but we really never came down to recognizing it or planning mitigating actions. For that matter, I don't think any business did. And I don't even think any nation did. It is therefore not surprising that many people call it a black swan event, which is a singular unexpected event. In reality, COVID-19 is not a black swan. It is the first in a series of what NYT's Tom Friedman refers to as a herd of stampeding black elephants, multiple predictable and economically catastrophic events. These are events which we know are coming, but as a society, we have been in denial. Professor Andrew Cunningham of the Zoological Society of London advised that the emergence and spread of COVID-19 was not only predictable, but it was predicted. A 2007 study of the 2002-03 SARS outbreak published in the Clinical Microbiology Review included the presence of a large reservoir of a SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats, together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China, is a time bomb. Years of abuse and non-sustainable consumption has ravaged nature. The effects of climate change and loss of biodiversity has spurred a rise in zoonotic diseases, infections that come from animals, in fact, it was the UN environment chief, Inger Anderson, who had warned 
Never before have so many opportunities existed for pathogens to pass from wild and domestic animals to people. And he had explained that 75% of all emerging infectious diseases come from the wildlife. The question that you may have is, what then are the other potential crises staring at us? These are climate change, social and economic inequality, ocean and ecosystem collapse, water scarcity, amongst many others. Social, economic, environmental issues that existed prior to the pandemic have been pushed into stark focus. The world's richest one person owned 44% of the world's wealth. And at the same time, more than 700 people go to bed hungry. The environment continues to deteriorate. And even today, one in three people across the world do not have access to what would be called as a safe drinking water. As well as the direct economic impact, many of these issues could drive social instability, civil unrest, nationalism, debt and credit crisis, protectionism, geopolitical realignment, and even possible military conflict, further magnifying the economic consequences. So what is going to be the likely impact on the global economy? Last month, the IMF projected global growth to contract by 4.9% this year. They expect a partial recovery to happen in 2021. The exceptional action taken by many countries, including the G20, through fiscal measures of about $11 trillion and massive central bank liquidity injections could perhaps put a floor under the global economy. In reality, though, it is very difficult to project the, image, the impact of the virus on the economy as many variables are still at play. The trajectory of the virus in many parts of the world, including our own country, is still unknown. A second major wave could lead to further disruptions in economic activities, uncertainty about when an effective vaccine would be found, and then its availability and distribution, the effectiveness of government's efforts to contain the economic impact, and of course, also the reaction of the consumers and the firms, which again would depend on the longevity of the crisis. Many would like to believe that the world economy and India is on the path to recession. Well, the recession risk is very real, but let us not take it for a foregone conclusion. Many countries will, of course, be deeply affected by the economic scars of this crisis. Labor market dislocations, bankruptcies will become common, and education of nearly a billion learners across 150, 60 countries have been disrupted. The bottom line is that the pandemic is likely to increase poverty and inequality and painfully expose the weakness in health systems, the precariousness of work, and the challenging prospects for the young of accessing opportunities that they desperately need. How is it going to impact the global trade? This has perhaps delivered the greatest shock to international trade since the Great Depression. Global trade in 2020 is projected to decline by 20% according to a baseline scenario. And it is not projected to regain its 2019 absolute level of $18 trillion until 2023. The crisis is, of course, exacerbating the deteriorating US-China trade relations putting more than $650 billion in annual two-way trade at risk. Among the sharpest possible shifts are the two-way trade between the US and China, which could possibly be shrinking by more than $100 billion. Similarly, EU trade with China is estimated could decline by nearly $30 billion. Companies will be compelled to revise the mix of products and the design of the global supply chains, and the governments, the trade and economic policies to adapt to the shifts. This will be particularly true in segments such as medical equipment, pharmaceutical products, semiconductors, which are particularly exposed to geopolitical factors. Will it exacerbate geopolitical frictions? Who better than all of you to answer this question? I, though, do believe that the crisis of this magnitude has the potential to reshape the world order. In recent years, we have seen a trend away from globalization with countries becoming more parochial. This crisis has already accelerated the trend towards nationalist policies. Global and regional partnerships are being put to test. Multilateral organizations 
like WHO have been marginalized. How is it impacting consumer behavior? Well, coming from a consumer goods company, I will pick up and share with you with a few very discernible trends. First is what we call as the COVID cocooning. Around the world, consumers are cocooning by retreating into their homes. This is a mass behavior change on a scale we have never seen before. This is powering a fast growing, a stay at home economy, home cooking, home entertainment, home exercise, and working from home. The second is e everything. Life in the times of COVID 19 is increasingly a life lived online. Consumers are spending more time online, connecting, communicating, working, shopping, informing, educating, and entertaining themselves. This is perhaps spurring a three to five years digital revolution in three to five months, with consumers adopting new e-habits at scale. The third behavior I would talk about is clean living. Clean has become a cult in the coronavirus era, as consumers fetishize cleaning, cleansing, and clean living. Products and services offering effective cleaning, sanitizing, sterilizing, and disinfecting benefits are being adopted among germophobic consumers open to antibacterial, antiviral, antiseptic, and anti-dirt promises. The fourth is contactless culture. Consumers are shifting to a touch-free, contactless culture as the human touch is now feared rather than cherished. Beyond social distancing, social shielding, and self-isolation, we expect more consumers to avoid touching surfaces, materials, and even their own faces. The fifth is health and well-being. Consumers are taking measures to prevent infection and safeguard and shield themselves from the threat of viral with safety first and risk averse norms. People are getting increasingly conscious about their physical health, boosting their immunity. And in urban India, we're also seeing people increasingly conscious about the mental well-being. The sixth is value seeking. In the face of uncertainty, fear and anxiety, consumers are shifting to value-based volume shopping and low unit price packs or access packs are likely to grow as the recession fear looms. Let me now summarize the width and depth of the situation. This is a crisis like no before. It is more complex with interlinked shocks to health and economies that have brought a way of life to a near halt. Pandemics don't respect borders, neither do the economic shocks they cause. At the beginning of the year, IMF was projecting 160 economies to register positive per capita income growth, and now they are saying 170 countries will see negative income growth. As a banker argued in a recent economic analysis of the impact of the pandemic, and the banker said, historic global crises like wars, revolution, and pandemics often feel like they put history on fast forward. Processes that normally take decades or longer to play out unfold in a couple of weeks. Coronavirus is a political, economic, and psychological event of a lifetime that will drive disruption and transformation for years to come. It will bring a radical transformation of the kind that occurs only once in a generation. So therefore, what does this crisis mean for a country, India? As far as the lives are concerned, we have lost about 62,000 people, and nearly 3.5 million people have been infected. The daily new cases are still creeping, and they are at 75,000 a day. India's economic growth had slowed down even before the pandemic. The immediate impact of the national lockdown was severe supply chain constraint. From a demand perspective, the fear of loss of job, dwindling earnings, and eroding investments have made people circumspect with their spends. The McKinsey-Oxford economic scenario suggests that India's GDP could contract between minus three to minus nine for the current year, depending on the effectiveness of the virus containment and economic policy responses. The slowdown in the wheels of the economy could potentially lead to financial crisis. 
while some organizations will be able to raise funding or latch on to the lifeline sent by the governments, many businesses will stare at ruin. The impact will vary from sector to sector, with some seeing a relatively quick rebound, and many others will feel a sustained loss of output. There are several sectors which have been impacted very hard. Airlines, hotels and restaurants, tourism, real estate, to pick a few. These are also sectors which create a lot of employment. The fiscal cost of support could be substantial, and the rising debt levels could pose a serious concern. However, at this stage in the crisis, I believe that the cost of not doing may turn out to be greater than the cost of support. Let me now reflect a bit on the journey that we have been on a country in the last seven decades. When India got its independence, our pockets were empty and we had virtually no industrial base. The industrial revolution had bypassed us. The total GDP of the country adjusted for today's prices was less than the market capitalization of Hindustan Unilever today. We had muted growth of three, three and a half percent in the first four decades, when the population was growing by one and a half, two percent. The story has dramatically changed in the last three decades when India has grown by an average of six and a half percent, with the GDP reaching nearly three trillion dollars. And for many years, we proudly wore the tag of one of the fastest growing economies in the world. When we look at three trillion dollars, then a heart justifiably swells with pride because it makes us one of the top few economies in the world. However, the issue is with per capita GDP or income, which really determines the quality of life of an average Indian. At just about $2,000, it remains a significant issue. Therefore, we as a nation must dream big, think big, and act big. How about making India a $10 trillion economy in the next decade and a half? This would lift the GDP per capita and take us to a middle income country status, but this will necessitate that we cross the chasm of the six to six and a half percent average growth that we have delivered over the last three decades and move over to our required and potential growth rate of eight to 10 percent. This level of transformational growth will change India completely. We must also appreciate that this level of growth is required to gainfully engage the 10 to 12 million youth who join the workforce every year. With this perspective, let me now share with you some of the key challenges we as a nation face and some of the steps we could and I believe we should take, both from a short-term and long-term perspective. First is protect our people. As the economy opens, the risk of getting infected will also rise. The best way to contain this pandemic till a vaccine is developed is the time-tested public health principles of contact tracing followed by testing and treatment quarantine of suspect cases and the sound public health hygiene practices, cuff etiquette and use a mask, frequent hand washing with soap, if I may say life by soap, and water, a use of sanitizer and physical distancing. One of the primary reasons for the hard lockdown we had in a country is the fragile nature of our healthcare. Money should now be diverted towards building healthcare infrastructure. We need to harness technology and make a quantum shift in reach quality and affordability of healthcare. Within the healthcare sector, we also have the pharmaceutical industry. Indian pharma is the third largest by volume and 11th largest in value terms. The size of the industry is about $41 billion with equal contribution from exports and domestic sales. Potentially, the revenue could grow up to $100 billion by 2030 and we could double our shares to 7%. In the global COVID-19 crisis, the Indian pharma industry has been serving the country and the world with uninterrupted supplies of the life-saving drugs. However, this pandemic has also exposed some serious structural challenges that the pharma industry faces, especially its over-dependence 
on imports for API, which is the active pharmaceutical ingredients, especially from China. The industry needs to move up the value chain by investing in the much needed R&D. India has a massive opportunity to become an affordable and quality healthcare capital of the world. The second important bit is make technology a game changer. The epidemic has accelerated our digital journey and provided it the much needed acceleration. Many of our fellow citizens move to online for the first time, whether to get news or to source essentials. City children had the first taste of online schooling and office goers adapted to working from home, leveraging remote collaboration tools. It moved us from a theory of, from a state of theoretical debate on whether it will work or not to real hands-on experience. We should leverage this momentum to make a fundamental shift in quality of education and healthcare in creating new business models, which in turn would create jobs. Bring technology to agriculture, manufacturing, and management of environment, and in governance to usher efficiency and transparency. As a country, we can leapfrog and become world leaders in precision and advanced manufacturing, harnessing data analytics and AI for advanced scientific research and deployment at scale in the economy. Y2K at the start of this millennium gave a fillip to the Indian IT industry. The present crisis should be used to digitally connect the nation. This is a fabulous opportunity for the Indian IT industry to move up the value chain. India has the lowest cost of data in the world. We should use the low cost of data combined with the increased penetration of low cost smartphones and use the massive amount of data that the nation generates for greater public good. We should protect privacy, but treat data as a national asset and not like the walled gardens of the West. Third is transform agriculture. About 50% of the country's workforce is dependent on agriculture, which contributes just about 17, 18% of the country's GDP. Small and marginal farmers in India with land holdings of less than two hectares account for about 85% of India's farming population. Various studies on the agri and related value chain have indicated a loss ranging from 10 to 30 percent on account of poor post-harvest management, including deficient warehousing, cold chain logistics and processing facilities. From farm gate to a consumer, a horticulture product passes through seven different intermediaries, and at every stage there is a loss of five to seven percent. India's yield in many products is 60 to 75 percent of the global best in class. 80 percent of the water consumption in India is used in agriculture, and this has been, if I may say, grossly mismanaged. We process a very small part of our production today, and processing of fruits and canning of vegetables can multiply the value anywhere from 50 to 500 times. Yes, India has reached self-sufficiency in gross food grains, with production moving towards the 300 million tons. If we look at it from the lens of gross calories, our population on an average is now consuming something in the vicinity of 2,225 calories per day, which is very close to the recommended consumption. However, the challenge is the quality of nutrition. We consume calories in an unbalanced manner with too much simple, simple carbohydrates and not enough of complex carbohydrates and proteins. It is therefore not a surprise that as a nation, we are protein and micronutrient deficient. The pandemic has made us conscious about the benefits of immunity and nutrition, helps build immunity. Malnutrition has a huge impact on the society as the vitamin and mineral deficiencies impose a significant burden in terms of health costs, lost human capital, and reduced economic productivity. A small country like Netherlands is the second largest exporter of agriculture and horticulture products, whereas our share of trade is a measly 2.5%. We need to transform agriculture because of the number of people who depend on it for their livelihoods, the need to boost nutrition amongst the population, and also a fact that our cities do not have the infrastructure to cope with large-scale migration. Transformation will require extensive use of technology, building of infrastructure, sustainable agri-practices, traceability from farm to fork, cluster approach, 
empowerment of FPOs and bringing in large organized players if we have to get into growing import substitute products like palm, for instance. The government has recently taken some very right steps by bringing in amendments to the Essential Commodities Act and the Agriculture Products Marketing Committee Act, which removes the barrier to trade investments and competition. Our collective aim should be to become the granary and the breadbasket to the world. The fourth is reinvigorate ma manufacturing. The challenge that we need to take on is how do we reinvigorate manufacturing, including construction in the economy? These sectors have the potential to give the biggest lift to productivity and job growth, respectively. India must position itself to be a bigger part of the global supply chain. We should focus on sectors where we have natural advantage or where, as a nation, we can create competitive advantage. Let me raise a few points that we need to do in this area. First is reform the factors of production. India badly needs reforms in the area of land, labor, and capital. We must unlock supply in land markets and reduce its cost by 20 to 25 percent. We should create flexible labor markets, strengthen the safety nets, and provide portable benefits to make labor more mobile. The cost of borrowing in India is higher than our peer countries by about 400 to 500 bits. The biggest benefit, benefit can come out of reducing the credit intermediation in the banking system where heavy bank borrowing by the government crowds out the private sector and high NPAs in the banking sector increases the cost. Second is we should increase the ease, but to reduce the cost of doing this. To give you an example, logistics in the country as a percentage of GDP is estimated as being 500 to 600 bits higher than other developed countries. While India has climbed up the ladder when it comes to ease of doing business, there's much more to do if India has to become one of the most attractive destinations for investment. Third, scale does matter. India will have to compete for an increased share of global pie, not in one dimension, but on cost, quality, service, and innovation. A recent McKinsey study indicates that in India has only got about 600 firms with annual revenues exceeding $500 million. It is apparent that large firms not only help boost GDP and productivity, but they also act as catalysts for change, driving exports, invest in training, and pay higher wages. They're also nimbler and more innovative in adopting technology. India's challenge is we have fewer large companies, and there is scope to close the gap in productivity and profitability. It is not that we cannot do. Hindustan Unilever has the lowest cost and the highest return on capital employed as compared to any other large Unilever business in the world. Fourth is accelerate disinvestments. There are two imperatives for disinvestment. India's public sector enterprises are generally inefficient and will find it difficult to compete in an open globalized world. And secondly, the government will need money to kickstart and accelerate growth. Fifth is small and medium enterprise. In the U.S., the strength of the economy is built on its small and medium-sized enterprise. After the financial crisis of 2008, small entrepreneurs helped America get back on its feet, creating 60% of the net new jobs between 2008 and 13. Today, SMEs employ 40% of that country's workforce. In India, it's a different story. Only a little more than 10% of our employees are in similar enterprises. We have millions of micro enterprises, but these are neither job creating nor resilient. Those who work for them do so informally with little protection or security. For operations like this, the pandemic has been a grave challenge and many may not survive. We must ensure all SMEs in every corner of a country have access to financing and technical knowledge required to succeed. Today morning, I was attending a meeting with the Gujarat chief minister when he was unveiling the new industrial policy. He said, for SMEs in Gujarat, they, they could first start the business and then seek approvals. Their policy is first production and then permission. Can't we roll this out in the rest of the country? The fifth important bit is how do we preserve the financial stability? Job losses, bankruptcies, and industry restructuring could pose significant challenges for the financial sector. 
including great losses to financial institutions. The loan book of the banking industry is about 100 lakh crore rupees in the country. And the total capital of the banks is about 11, 12% of the loan book. The banks in the last few years have been reeling under NPAs. If, say, the pandemic results in another 5 to 6% of the loan book going bad, then the capital base of the banks will become very precarious. The NBFCs or non-banking financial companies are under severe crisis when one of the big NPFCs in India, the ILNFS, uh, failed. NBFCs credit, create credit among those segments to whom banks are skeptical of lending. As NBFC struggle, the banks cut down on the exposure to this institution, further exacerbating the lending situation in the country. Regulation and supervision should support the flexible use of existing capital and liquidity buffers. Monetary policy should remain accommodative where output, output gaps are significant and inflation is below target, as has been the case recently in our country. In our country, we must be cognizant of strengthening and protecting the capital base of a financial institution, especially the public sector banks. A possible resolution to the issue of NPAs, or the non-performing assets, is establishing a bad bank, a separate legal entity, where risk can be transferred and which aggressively pursues the recovery of NPAs. Let me now dwell on a few issues which I believe are extremely important to the world of business and to the society at large. First is strengthen globalization. All of us need all of us and not some of us. The reality is that this crisis is neither a one country problem nor can one country solve it. It will require the collective efforts of the world community. Collective action within communities and internationally will enable more rapid and peaceful exit from the crisis. Unfortunately, we see a total absence of global leadership. If we cannot globally contain the spread of the pandemic, we may see a resurgence later. The virus has exposed the dangers of connectedness without cooperation. We have been unable to stop a global crisis because we have been unable to rally a global response to it. Hence, despite the divisiveness, the case for winning as one world is more important than ever before. Despite the pushback to multilateralism, India should play a proactive role in moving to a more collaborative world and strengthen the multilateral institutions. This is also a great opportunity to reform institutions like WTO and UN. Restoring the efficacy of this institution means restoring the moral authority, which is sadly absent today. We will need to push the reset button on the world to ensure a just transition to a better future. Over $11 trillion in economic stimulus packages could run the risk of distorting global markets to the detriment of poorer nations. That transition needs to address all the convergent prices, and it can be done only with international cooperation. This will also be vital to ensure that when the vaccines are produced, they're not cornered by the rich and famous, but there is fair distribution. No one is stronger than all of us collectively. Atma Nirbhar Bharat, as the Prime Minister Mr. Modi has clarified, is not shutting down doors to the outside world or becoming protectionist in nature, but becoming a bigger and more important part of the global economy. Second, move to compassionate capitalism. Winston Churchill, though I'm not very really fond of him, guys, said, the inherent vice of capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings, the inherent virtue of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. The virus has been a leveler when it comes to sharing of miseries. It does not differentiate between the rich and poor, between the urban and rural, between the developed and the developing world. However, the aftermath is much more severe on the poor, who run the risk of losing the livelihoods and the developing nation who will struggle with the meager resources. Today, as we stand, the rich and the developed should not shirk away from the responsibility towards the poor and the developing. As Mahatma Gandhi said, the rich must live simply that the poor can simply live. We must share the blessings of capitalism to take away the miseries of the society and collectively win. The world needs to change in many ways to ensure much more equitable distribution of wealth and resources. 
I'm a capitalist and firmly, firmly believe that this is the best way to allocate scarce resources. However, the current model of capitalism, where there's one dimensional focus on shareholder value creation and winner takes all needs to change. In fact, the history of business in India reflects the ethos of compassionate capitalism and India should lead the way for others to emulate. The third, progress decisively on climate action. COVID-19 could potentially halt the progress on climate action. We should not be taken in by the initial drop in pollution and emission due to lockdown or the clear skies over Mumbai. As there could be a severe bounce back effect on the environment as economies reboot. In our country, the impact of global warming is very pronounced. In the last two decades, 10 major floods hit India, causing economic damage of over $45 billion, killing over 27,000 people and affecting over 370 million people. If India does not change the management of its water resources, we will have half the water we need in a few decades. The flashpoint is not very far away. We need should get away from procrastination, half measures, and work together to flatten the climate curve. Take concrete steps to better manage the water resources and keep plastic away from the environment. India could and should take a lead in renewable energy with the same passion as we undertook the electrification of villages. Fourth is be adaptive and resilient. We have realized that even with the best prediction models, we cannot predict our way to a no-risk world. This therefore means we must become far more adaptable. The crisis has shown adaptable teams retool in a matter of days. On the other hand, seemingly successful organizations with vast prediction capabilities get paralyzed as the virus spread. During the crisis, many organizations driven by low cost, high efficiencies and capacity utilization were caught on the wrong foot. These businesses need to determine which parts of the value chain do they manage for cost and efficiency and where do they build for redundancy so that it is resilient to shocks. Just as there is need for business to build adaptability and resilience, so is the need for nations. The fifth and very importantly, the coronavirus pandemic has been a test of character for millions around the world. To successfully navigate, leaders must get comfortable with ambiguity and chaos, recognizing that there is no crisis playbook to guide them. Instead, they should commit themselves to navigate through the turbulence, adjusting, improvising, and redirecting as the situation changes and the new information emerges. We need courage to seize opportunity. Courageous leaders also understand they will mistakes along the way and they will have to pivot quickly as this happens, learning as they go and not being deterred by failures. Effective leaders, as we have seen during the crisis, stand out for the empathy, transparency and humility. It is perfectly fine for all leaders not to have all the answers. There is ample evidence to show that leaders who trust and empower their teams unleash powerful potential. The job of the leader is to provide brutal optimism, a clear account of the challenges ahead, but credible hope that collectively they have the strategy and the resources to overcome the crisis. A good leader should also look beyond the immediate crisis. Leadership during this moment has the potential to create a virtuous cycle of raising morale and growth in the society by lifting mood and spirits, channelizing the energies towards better performance, which in turn spurs the economy and thus saves jobs and lifts the society. Let me end by reiterating my belief in human ingenuity and a capacity to change. I believe that when humankind decide to change, there is virtually no limit on how fast or how dramatically we can do so. But first, we have to decide to change. This is about choice not about a capacity to deliver. Each and every black elephant is fixable if we act in time. We have the technology, we can create financial capacity, we have the intellect, the humanity, and the visceral instinct to survive. As Indians, we should embrace this crisis as an opportunity to craft a different and better future together. This is a moment that tests our humanity. It must be met with solidarity. Let us transform our country into a frontier economy and a country that is fairer and inclusive, more equitable, 
greener and more sustainable, healthier and smarter, and very importantly, more adaptable and resilient. Thank you so much for listening to me. Now, Anupam, over to you. Thank you, Sanjeev. That was, uh, uh, I took notes, uh, it was very, very uh, impressive. If it's okay with you, uh, I think I'll try and lay down the major points which I think that you made. And then we will open the floor to questions. Some have already come in. Firstly, Sanjeev, allow me to compliment you on, uh, on a masterly uh, speech, masterly statement. There are so many subjects that you uh, covered. Uh, we are used to writing uh, speeches for prime ministers and presidents and so on. And uh, there are things which you said today which will guide us. There are things which you said today which uh, I think uh, should uh, enter what we uh, advise our leaders to do. Uh, what came out uh, at, a, at a very interesting level is how committed you are to human rights, climate, compassionate capitalism. These are not uh, what one always uh, associates a top businessman with. In fact, you spoke very little about business and much more about the type of the country that uh, we should be. I think that is uh, quite uh, uh, impressive, and uh, it, it was a learning. It was a learning for us. Uh, for us, uh, as a as a group, I think uh, what is unusual is watching you or hearing you describe what life looks at the highest levels of business. The vast uh, array of figures, facts perspectives that you brought in was uh, very, very interesting. I understand now what makes you a thought leader and a captain of industry. It, it really is uh, very, very impressive. The, your account of the 70 years was fascinating. The industries that you touched on, technology, agriculture, pharma, horticulture, banking, logistics. Uh, you touched on Tom Friedman to Churchill to Mahatma, climate change, water. You know, renewable electricity and your your uh, last line about uh, frontier economy and brutal optimism were very powerful. Uh, thank you. Th these are the things that I uh, learned. Now, I'm going to abuse my position as moderator to ask the first uh, questions of you. Please, please do. So there are two questions uh, that uh, I have uh, for you. I mean, the first is. Uh, you know, Unilever is a global company. And yet this, the, the address that we heard from you today was from an Indian. You, you know, you, you're obviously Indian first and uh, Unilever second. And uh, I want to ask you uh, how, what we can learn from a, a company like uh, Unilever the fact that it allows uh, this kind of uh, expression to uh, develop is actually quite striking. An uh, international company allows you to become more Indian uh, or uh, remain as Indian is, uh, uh, is, is, is something which it struck me while you were speaking as uh, being extremely uh, striking. So I, we would like to hear uh, from that. Sure. That's sure. One. And again, I'm gonna misuse, I can see questions coming in, but my second question is, you know, you said that uh, there is a need for a new globalization. Now, the old form of globalization that we uh, have had until now was based on oh, the, the Washington consensus, Bretton Woods institutions, Adam Smith's laws of free trade and uh, so on. And we have ways of measuring that, you know, how many tariff lines are bound, unbound, uh, how many free trade agreements are you a part of, uh, how, how, how much freedom of movement do you have across borders and all that. Yeah. Would it be correct to say that uh, you, uh, would, may I ask you if you foresee a globalization 2.0 coming and what would be the measurables or the, or, or, the, or, or, or the metrics that one would use or what are the concepts that one would use to, to, to figure out whether that's such a globalization or a newer form of globalization is actually coming? Thank you. Sure. 
Yeah, first, let me come with the first uh, uh, question about Unilever and its ethos, especially in India. Yeah, most global corporations, if you look at, their thinking is that we think global and act local. Yeah, Unilever is different. In India, we think local. And if it makes sense, then we roll it out for the rest of the world. Yeah. In India, the reason why HOL is unique as a multinational, because its ethos is Indian. We think Indian, and we come with a very simple, but with a very profound belief that what is good for India is good for HOL. And we align ourselves with the national agenda. Just to give you a very small thing, you know, realizing that uh, India is going to face a very severe water crisis. About seven, eight years back, we said we need to make a difference. And we started working in about 5,000 villages. And over the last seven years, we have created a water potential of about 1.2 trillion liters, which is equivalent to meeting the drinking water needs of the entire population for a year. Now we did it not because it was forced upon us, because we thought we have to be part of the solution. So it has a very different thinking when it comes to, and very importantly, when I speak about compassionate capitalism, Having lived and worked in uh, Unilever now for three decades, we never talk about creating shareholder value. We say, if we look after our consumers, our customers, our employees, our suppliers, our society, and our planet, then in the process, the shareholder value will get created. And we have in HUL created immense value in the country. Yeah, from $17 billion seven years back to $70 billion now. That's the kind of value we have created. So compassionate capitalism does work. Yeah, so that is the first ethos of uh, Unilever. Now, coming to the new world order. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The Bretton Woods and the way the globalization happened, it was... Uh, chartered and created by the victors of the Second World War. But we must also appreciate that development and progress in the last three decades would not have happened if we had isolated ourselves. Yeah? And the bigger India opportunity, the global opportunity for India still awaits us. We have not yet harnessed that opportunity as, for instance, India has done. And when our time has come to get the benefit of the world economy, the world should not retreat into the shell because it would be to the detriment of countries like India. But where do we need to pivot, for instance? Let's take climate action. First is, I think let us accept that on a per capita basis, we cannot have greenhouse gas emissions in India, like for instance, what happened in China, if what happened in the US and in Europe, because we would end up destroying the world. Yeah, but then if we don't work collectively, we will end up in a scenario where the developed world will push the developing world and we would not be able to get the kind of growth that we need to have. So the rebalancing of this, you know, when the, uh, uh, the Paris Accord happened, there was a very clear understanding of transferring of money so that the poor people could come out with actions which would help in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Now, unfortunately, those are not being implemented. So, but if we don't take the lead in creating a new world order, look at UN today. Yeah, it's become a very meek organization. Or look at what has happened to the World Health Organization. Yeah, completely decimated, right? There's no moral authority left with what US did to them. So it's very important for us to play a lead role 
in bringing the world together. It would be our enlightened self-interest to get the world together. And one of the best jobs you guys can do for us is get us a seat on the Security Council. Thanks, uh, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, I would, uh, I'm going to, I mean, I, I have a supplementary to that, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, I'll, uh, my first, the first question from the floor is from Dr. Arjun Deore. He's uh, in Brasilia. He says, nice to meet you. And uh, while, while, like you're, while he's, uh, you've answered a part of his questions, which is about Atmanir uh, Bhar uh, Bharat. Uh, uh, he says that uh, the, the the first part of his question is uh, how do how does a company like Unilever uh, see uh, uh, Atmanibar Bharat? I think you have answered that. The second uh, uh, question two and question three are what are the future plans of Unilever in line with PM's call for Atmanibar Bharat? Basically, how do you uh, how do you make it look? Uh, uh, how do you operationalize operationalize it on the ground? Sure. And how does the this is an interesting question? I mean, how does how do you compare? Indian response uh, to COVID-19, especially in terms of the lockdown, uh, when yeah. you, from a perspective like yours, when you have operations in countries like UL, US and Brazil, where there is no nationwide lockdown. It's a very specific yeah. question. Yeah. Thank, you. Well, thank you for that. So I'll answer both the question. First is on the Atmanirbhar Bharat. First is uh, very importantly, you, you know, when this vocal for local happened, many multinationals got worried. Yeah, I wasn't worried because uh, I was listening to the Prime Minister's speech very carefully, and I knew exactly what he meant when he was talking about vocal for local. Yeah. Now, as a company here, 99.5% of the products that we sell in the country, we manufacture in the country. Yeah. But what we have done, we believe that we also have a role to play in nation building. So we have given certain thought papers to the government of India. One is, for instance, how could we as a nation do import substitution of palm oil? We are one of the largest consumers of palm oil, something like six, seven billion dollars. So we have given a complete thought paper on that subject of what the nation could do. Second is, we have said, how could we import, how could we export more of tea from India and more of FMCG goods from the country. So we have given two more thought papers on export of tea and export of FMCG. And uh, to grow the FMCG country, in the country, it's also very important that we take the packaging industry to the new level. So we have given another thought paper up to the government on what we could do. So we believe it is not just us. As the largest consumer goods company in the country, we have to take that lead in helping and giving our thoughts to the government of India. And uh, at least the response has been very po positive. They were very much appreciative of the kind of thoughts that we have provided to them. Now, coming to lockdown, because I'm part of the global board of Unilever, I have access to what is happening across the world. And I can say very clearly that India had perhaps the most severe lockdown anywhere in the world. Yeah? And uh, I agree with what the government did. Think of the situation when the actions were taken. Our healthcare system was extremely fragile. Despite the lockdown, in the months of April and May, our healthcare systems in Delhi and Mumbai were overwhelmed. Had we not brought in the lockdown, India would not have been able to cope with it. Yes, there has been an economic cost, huge amount of cost, yeah? But I think the government owes it to the people to protect them first. Now, coming to government stimulus package, if we really look at it, what the government has done. First is, they've lent a helping hand to the most deserving, that's the poor. Whether it is increasing the daily rate of Manrega or the outlay of Manrega, whether it is giving uh, free food, or the direct transfer of money, absolutely the right thing. The most poor needed the money. 
The second thing what the government has done, created a lifeline for the MSMEs, be it uh, through liquidity, be it through differing moratorium. And again, I would believe that they have done absolutely the right thing. Now the question comes that the government hasn't done anything for the big industry and the government hasn't done anything for the demand. Now one must understand that yes, our hands are tied. We do not have the fiscal space to come out with the largest like what the US has done for instance. But I believe that at some stage to start the virtuous spiral of growth the government will have to stimulate the demand. So sooner or later, something they might be keeping the powder dry, not spending the entire money, but they will have to come out with it. It would not have made sense that to spend the money on demand stimulation when the country was under a lockdown, it would not have resulted in anything. I can also understand what must be going on in the mandarins of finance minister, ministry. They would be worried that if we give money in the hands of people, they might end up as savings rather than stimulating them. So it will have to be thought through carefully, but I think this is one measure which will have to come in sooner rather than later. Thank you. It's very uh, interesting to hear your perspective uh, of uh, government policies uh, coming from a person uh, uh, who is the top uh, businessman? Uh, we have completed an hour. I have about six or seven more questions. Are you? I mean, that's yeah, about please go. Please go. Yeah. So are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So and there are more questions coming in. So I'll try to cop, cap it at about uh, one and a half hours or so. Uh, yeah. Or so. Yeah, that's the thing. So uh, the next question is from. Uh, to geopolitical risks given recent incidents worldwide. Sorry, I, will, I lost you for a while. Could you repeat yeah. the question? How, how are companies like Unilever yeah. building resilience to yeah. geopolitical risks? Yeah. You know, for instance, uh, uh, we have a business in Iran. And uh, of course, with the sanctions, that business was uh, very clearly on the verge of shutdown. And had the pandemic not happened, perhaps we would have had to shut down and exit from the country. But because we deal in essentials, like uh, soaps, sanitizers, disinfectants, we've been allowed to continue for some time. Yeah, From our perspective as Unilever, we are absolutely clear that if we reach a stage where we cannot practice our values, then we will exit from the country. Yeah? So from that lens, we are very clear. But then we are a very apolitical company. We never give donations. We never take part in political activities. We never side with political agendas and we remain what I would call as a pride. Yeah, but because of the values that we bring to the country and to the business fraternity in the country, I think in most countries, Unilever is a very respected brand. Uh, I can uh, give you, you know, I have been at the eye of a storm caught in some of the geopolitical things. When the Arab Spring happened, just to give you an example, uh, I was uh, leading the business in North Africa and Middle East. And uh, uh, one of our partners was the industry minister in Mr. Mubarak's cabinet. And when Mr. Morsi took over, they thought that Unilever 
is a company belonging to that gentleman. So suddenly we had something like 120 show cause notices. Yeah, questioning us on every goddamn thing, opening up tax assessments, environment, everything. And then I had to fix a meeting with Mr. Morsi. Go and explain to him who Unilever is and the partner which they thought is the owner of this company is a minority shareholder. And when he understood that, then sanity prevailed and within a couple of weeks, the show cause notices were slowly withdrawn and life became normal. So we do come across these kind of situations, but uh, we are absolutely, we remain upright, we do not side, and, uh, but we carry our values, uh, which are very dear to us everywhere. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chajiv. That Arab Spring uh, account is a fascinating uh, The next question is a usual one. It's uh, from Sumit Seth. Uh, he wants to know, he says that he sees a lot of books in your background. And he says, which is the, uh, I, I think I'm going to spring this on you. So he says, can you please share which is the book you have read most recently and, uh, and uh, which has moved you and made you uh, think or has made you go, wow. Okay. Let me tell you, if, say, in all my books in my study, if I have to pick up one book, and just one book and recommend to everyone, then it would be why My Years with General Motors by Alfred Sloan. Yeah. Now, this book was written many decades back. But the principles of management are still valid today. But if you were to ask me, which are the books that I have read in the last uh, couple of months? One is, uh, of course, uh, Backstage by Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia. Fascinating book of what happened during the 90s, during the liberalization. And I would urge you guys, yeah, you are more in touch with the government than I am, that please read that book. It's a very good book. And the second book is I've read is uh, by Schwarzman, who is the founder of uh, Blackstone. And it gives a lot of insights into uh, how he founded his great empire. And a book I've just purchased from Amazon, which uh, I was planning to read over the weekend, is uh, by Scott Page on diversity. Yeah, I read a bit of excerpts and I found it fascinating. So the next time uh, we chat, I would be very happy to give you insights from that book. Well, so when, he actually reads the books. <laughs> so that was a uh, that was a good one. This is from uh, uh, from Gloria, uh, who is our uh, the pre who is the, the general secretary of our association. How do you see reshaping of supply chains, especially in consumer goods sector in India, not just due to COVID-induced bottlenecks, but also tensions between China and India? Yeah. Do you see yes. Indian manufacturers picking the slack quickly, and what about quality issues? Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, a very valid question. I'll tell you something when. Uh, China went into a crisis mode in early January, late December. I formed a crisis team in India, but that crisis team was not anticipating the pandemic to come to India, but because we import certain chemicals from China, I wanted to set up alternative, understanding that the supply lines might uh, get disrupted. And so the good bit has been that when the Ladakh crisis happened, we have been very well prepared to cover up if the supply lines from China get totally disrupted. Yeah. Now, this is a massive opportunity for India, and India should not lose it. 
you know, I was talking about uh, when I was speaking to you all that uh, possibly the, U- the U.S.-China trade could be disrupted by $100 billion. The Europe-China uh, trade could be disrupted by $30 billion. Now, this is a great opportunity waiting to be tapped. And India could move in and get a good share of it. But it's not going to be easy. The competitors, generally in India, people talk about that countries like Vietnam, et cetera, are going to compete for that share of pie. But I believe it is not just Vietnam, even countries in East Europe who have a very strong engineering and manufacturing base could become very good, big competitors for that piece of pie. And that is the reason why India should embark on reforms with huge amount of speed so that we can encash once in a generation uh, where uh, global supply chains would be looking at alternatives to China. As far as FMCG is concerned, yeah, we have a very large indigenization program. Leaving aside certain specialty chemicals, etc., which come from abroad, a large part of the value chain does get created within the country. But more importantly is, for us, how can we have global cost base so that we can become an export source of FMCG products to the rest of the world? I think that is an opportunity which we need to tap into. Uh, thank you. Sanjeev, Who, who's that? Okay, so Thanks. next question, Ambassador Sanjeev Singla. He has two questions. The first is, for many years now, I have regarded Hindustan Unilever's quarterly business reports as a better litmus report of real consumer demand, especially rural demand in India. Well, there's somebody other than me who reads those reports in our service, obviously. So in that context, it was heartening to see your last report, according to which rural demand in India was back to nearly 80 to 90% of pre-lockdown levels. What would you like to share your prognosis for the next quarter? His next question is on consumer behavior. Should I give you the next question? Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. On consumer behavior, luxury goods are sometimes thought to be relatively recession-proof. Hindustan Unilever obviously has a keen ear to the ground when it comes to consumer behavior. So even though you had an FMCG company, would you like to share your thoughts on how consumer behavior, especially among younger post-millennial generation, might be changing with regard to products like diamonds? I ask this because diamonds comprise about 40% of India-Israel bilateral trade. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. First is, let me talk about rural India. Rural India, before the onset of the pandemic, had slowed down appreciably. Now, just to give you a context, the per capita consumption of FMCG products in the country is just about $40 per annum. And when you benchmark it with, say, Indonesia, Indonesia is about uh, uh, 1.5x of India, and China is 3x of India, and Philippines, I know the ambassador to Philippines is here, is about uh, nearly uh, close to three and a half times that of India. And within this $40, rural India is half that of the average uh, of, the, uh, of the country. So it is less, it is about $18, $19 per capita. So the runway to grow in rural India is very high. In FMCG, there are two important ingredients for growth. One is more money in the hands of more people. And the second is what I call as the consumer confidence. Yeah. Now, rural India, the reason why the growth had... So if you look at it from a structural perspective, rural growth should be higher than urban growth for many years to come because the base is so small. But over the last few uh, uh, few quarters before the pandemic came in, rural growth had slowed down. And one of the reasons very clearly has been the low rate of wage increase in rural India. Yeah, because the inflation of food was very tepid. Now, the good bit has been with the government pumping in money, with Manrega, with direct transfer of money, you've got more money in the hands of people. 
The harvest also has been pretty decent. And all that put together, we are seeing a bit of resurgence back in rural consumption. But it's very important to understand that uh, just like one swallow doesn't make a British summer, similarly one quarter doesn't come to a conclusion that there has been a revival of rural demand. I would say that we should wait for a couple of quarters, and especially when the direct transfer of money to rural consumer stops, whether this demand sustains or not. Yeah, so that's what I would paint the picture. And as far as the country is concerned, too early to say, Sanjeev, yeah, we have to give it a few quarters to see how, what shapes up, because in recent times, there has been a lot of gyrations in the supply chain, unloading of stock, loading of stock, disruption, pantry loading. So I think we will have to see the September quarter and the December quarter to understand the underlying demand in the country. The second question is about the diamonds and uh, the, the Louis Vuitton consumers. If I take India, for instance, we have got 20 million households, which we call as a living standard measure seven plus in our lingo, whose purchasing power is as much as that of any family in a European nation. Now, these people, these households are pretty insulated from the recession. Yeah, when a recession happens, when a tough time happens, often what happens is the feeling that your wealth is eroding makes people circumspect with their spending. So these people will not cut back on small luxuries. Yeah, they may not buy the next Merc or a BMW, but when it comes to indulging in a Louis Vuitton bag, for instance, they will not shirk away from it. And that is the reason why we have also seen that the luxury goods sales in China after the month of March has bounced back majestically. Yeah, so this is a population which is pretty insulated. When it comes to diamond, I will confess, Sanjeev, that that is something I have not got much insight into. I am conscious that the new generation is not very enthused about owning assets. They want to be asset light, not just because they do not want, they do not have money. Even when they have access to money, they want to have the flexibility to be mobile. So, and they don't want to attach roots in any particular place. So when you look at it, they would be very happy, unlike our generation when we were growing up, you, you know, buying a house was a big dream. You start earning and the first thing you do, save money and try to buy a house. Not this generation. Yeah, they would be very happy leasing and renting a house. But as far as diamonds are concerned, I'm afraid I'll have to do a bit more research to understand what the consumer psyche about diamond is. And Sanjeev, next time you meet me, I would have done my homework. Uh, thanks. Uh, three or four more questions. Uh, three more. <laughs> the next question is from someone who prefers to remain uh, uh, anonymous. The question is, are you optimistic? It, it reads that uh, that the your assessments have been very guarded. Would you tell? Would you be able to tell us whether you are optimistic about uh, the economy and about the future of India? Yes, I am very optimistic about India. Yeah, I'm a realistic, but if I have to put put a bet, I will go long on India. Absolutely clear. I believe that India in the next, in this coming decade, will become the largest Unilever business in the world. Just think of it, a quintessential multinational. And India today, we are the second largest Unilever business in the world. We will become in this decade, the biggest Unilever business in the world. That's because of, I believe, the sheer potential that exists in our country. And if we were only to unshackle the spirit of a nation, we would again get back to the kind of growth that we all aspire for. So I'm absolutely, I will be guarded when it comes to near term. Yeah, because like I was explaining, 
there are many variables at play and I don't know when a vaccine will come and what will happen to the curve of the virus. But if you were to ask me for medium to long term, you know, during my watch, we have recently made an investment of acquiring in India, which has been the biggest merger in the history of FMCG. We spent 44,000 crores, it was by share swap, by acquiring the GSK business. Now that is because of, I've been able to convince Unilever about the future potential of India. And I believe it is absolutely massive. And you know, if we do not, if you're not able to realize the potential of the country, the future generation will look at our generation and say that you bugger screwed it up. And we would not like them to tell that to us. Uh, thank you. We are 25, so five more minutes. I'll ask one last. Uh, there are three more questions, but I'll cap it. At, I think we'll make it the last one. So okay. this, this question is, you mentioned you are friends in the Indian Foreign Service. What is your advice to officials representing the country abroad on how best they could represent interests of business in their sphere of work? Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad this question has been raised. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, if you look at, say, the US and uh, even a country like UK and Netherlands, the economic policy and the economic interest of the nation moves in tandem with the foreign policy. Yeah. In India's case, I think the commercial interests take a step back. I would urge you all, you know, for instance, I'll give you a very clear example. If we have to attract foreign investments to India, and if we have to attract multinational companies who are looking at alternate to China for sourcing, the lead has to be taken by our ambassadors in that nation. We have to go and make a pitch to those companies in a very pointed fashion and tell them why India is a great investment destination. And I'll offer you one more thing. When you go and make a pitch or you ask Invest India to make a pitch, at the end of the day, they will say, yeah, every government guy will tell good things about the country. Ask Hindustan Unilever to make a pitch on behalf of the country, and we will tell those companies why India is a great destination, which will be more credible than your pitch to those companies. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, you have a question for one, one last question? Please. Okay. So this is uh, with growing. This is from Anju Kumar, who's at the National Defense College. So she yeah. uh, teaches our generals. So with the growing nationalism and multipolarization, is there a serious threat to globalization in terms of economic growth and world trade? I think that's there is. There is definitely, and that is the reason why I talked about that as a country we have to take a lead in ensuring that we do not take a step back from globalization. There are many things at play in the world today. And unfortunately, multilateralism, we have taken a step back. I think we need to reverse that. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. I'm sorry, I have to guillotine the questions. Uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, we, we, uh, we've, let me uh, sum up by saying that we were extremely fortunate to have you. To the 70 odd people who attended this uh, when that is, uh, that is, I think, the highest attendance we've had so far. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something which uh, we will remember, your message of confidence in India, your message uh, of, uh, uh, of going long on India, your message that short term uh, problems notwithstanding, uh, we must persevere. Your message to us as diplomats that uh, we must push for more globalization. We must push more aggressively for India. And most importantly, that you are willing to work with us. I think the last thing that you said, that, that 
Unilever would back us up when we make a pitch for India. We'll resonate Absolutely. with many of us, the, many of the ambassadors who, uh, who are uh, who, and commercial officers who are attending, uh, who attended uh, this uh, event. Uh, thank you uh, once again. Um, uh, and uh, if I were to end with a thought, I would say that uh, one of our uh, greatest uh, exports or one of the strongest, uh, uh, one of the greatest assets we have for our brand is our manpower. And when we look at someone like you, who is uh, at the highest levels of business in the world, we understand why. In some ways, you are our greatest export, and you are people like you are our greatest uh, contribution to globalization. I, on behalf uh, of the Indian Foreign Service, Gloria Gante will uh, will thank you. But from from me personally, thank you very much for a most enlightening and interesting session. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. All yours. Thank you, Mr. Sanjeev Mehta, for having joined us on behalf of the Indian Foreign Service Association. I would like to uh, really thank you for you know your insightful thoughts and your passion for the country uh, that has come across in uh, what you have said. I think for many of us, it is a lot of food for thought, and uh, it is it will guide us uh, in what we do. Uh, in representing our country abroad. So what's really stood out for me was what you spoke on compassionate capitalism and uh, the Indian way that we can teach the world. And uh, this will bridge also the haves, bridging the gaps of uh, the haves and the have nots and your compassion that really came through uh, as you spoke of rural India and, you know, those people who are more marginalized and how Unilever is uh, looking at those areas also very closely. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, really say that we are proud uh, to have for, uh, companies like you and leaders like you uh, who think for the country and who pitch for the country in the long term. And thank you, Mr. Anupam Ray, for uh, having moderated this evening's uh, interaction really well and uh, you know, uh, giving it the direction that it has gone in. And thank you colleagues for all your questions and thank you Mr. Mehta for answering them so uh, patiently. And uh, thanks to all the participants who have woken up very early in the morning. I can see that uh, we have a lot of people from Latin America who were just waking up uh, uh, at this time of the day to uh, come uh, and listen to uh, this and join us this evening. Thank you. Thank you all. And until next time. Thank you, everyone. See you and keep safe.